empowering the blind to be excellent, do more, and live with greater success. This show is for you and about you. Welcome to the Delivering Access Podcast. All right, welcome back, Delivering Access Podcast listeners. I have someone very, very special on the show today, um, an individual that I've heard about for a number of years and um, finally got a chance to meet. As you guys heard, I was at the NFB of Pennsylvania's state convention and um, the individual who um, invited me there and, and had me to speak to their iPhone accessibility um, is a wonderful person by the name of Ms. Denise Brown. Denise, are you prepared to empower? I definitely am. Absolutely. So we're going to go ahead and dive right into it. Denise, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you grew up, how you became blind, and um, let the listeners know a little bit about you. Well, I grew up in Philadelphia, born and raised. I uh, attended the public schools in Philadelphia, graduated from them. I uh, also attended Temple University, where I have a bachelor's and a master's degree. And basically, uh, about at the age of two, my grandmother noticed that when I would be in a room with very dim light, that, mm -hmm. I, would bump, that I would bump into things. So then she decided to take me to Will's Eye Hospital, which is one of the premier uh, uh, eye hospitals in this country, and they diagnosed that I had something called retinitis pigmentosa, which I was mm -hmm. probably probably born with it. Um, and in the early years of my life, uh, basically the only thing that really bothered me was the fact that I had uh, night blindness. I didn't really have too much problems. Uh, like reading books or reading from the blackboard or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But but the night blindness was the first symptom of of my disease. Um, in school, I you know did like everybody else. I played you know sports, basketball, softball. Uh, and as I started losing a little more of my vision, uh, that kept me from playing. Uh, more so team sports. So okay. that's when I that's when I started running track because that was something individual that I could do in many aspects but still stay doing sports activities that I liked. Okay. And basically, I'd say um as I said, I graduated from public high school, you know, I was still able to read using my own eyes. I didn't have to use any adaptive technology. Same for when I went to college. But when I graduated from college with my bachelor's degree, I got a bachelor's degree in education and mm -hmm. I started my career as a teacher. Mm. And I taught sighted children. And the first few years of teaching was fine. Again, you know, my eyes were still able to pick up, you know, I was marking tests and homework and Mm -hmm. Putting a little, putting the little numbers in the grade book, <laughs> everything was good. Mm -hmm. And then, slowly, 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 more of my vision started diminishing. Where those types of things were kind of hard to do. Mm -hmm. But once I told the school district of Philadelphia, my principal, you know, about the problems that I was having, mm -hmm. um, you know, under you know, some type of accommodations act, uh, they were able to give me basically every type of technology that I basically needed to continue to do my job properly. Wow. So that all worked out well for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I guess to, to progress up to now, um, in, in 2001, I, um, learned about the National Federation of the Blind, which is, you know, you, you met me at an organ, uh, organized meeting of that group. Mm -hmm. And 
Two years later, in 2003, I became the president of the Greater Philadelphia chapter. And basically, I've been advocating for blind individuals ever since. Wow. And that's a great segue into the next question, um, which is, what's your desires and passion for the blindness community? I really want blind individuals to understand that they can really truly be as independent as possible uh, with some training and education. Mm-hmm. Um, there's so many ways out here to, con- to continue doing the same things you used to do, mm-hmm. but just doing them in a different way, you know, whether it's sewing, whether it's cooking, whether it's cleaning, um, you know, you can still uh, work in your home on your own. You can continue to look for a job like everyone else to, you know, get some competitive funds in your pocket. <laughs> I know that's right. Um, and students who are blind, you know, there's there's um, scholarships out there for individuals who are blind. And anybody, any young person who really wants to continue their education or continue looking for different types of jobs, there's almost always somebody blind already in that position that you could basically talk to about how they got where they are right now. So basically some mentor um, is there already and you don't have to recreate the wheel. Yes, that's that's correct. Okay, absolutely. And we'll get more into your mentor um, later in the interview. But what are some of the mainstream or assistive technologies that you're using right now to do uh, more each day? <laughs> well, that's uh, that's a plethora of <laughs> of uh, objects out there. Uh, on the computer, I use Magic. Uh, Magic has screen magnification and uh, screen reading capabilities. And right now I use more of the screen reading capabilities. Um, I use an iPhone, of course, and and an iPad. That voiceover technology is excellent. Mm -hmm. I do just about everything that anybody else does, text and read emails and make my flights and train reservations and everything else. Hmm. Um, in my home, I have, I have a talking thermostat, which, uh, I really love, uh, it allows me to set the temperatures at, at different times for different times of the day. And it automatically, uh, goes on and off to, um, regulate things around here. Um, I have a talking scale. I have a, a micro microwave oven that talks. Hmm. I use a white cane. I guess I'll call it that's, that's technology because I sure can't walk out the door without it. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a talking watch. Okay. So I guess there are just as many pieces of uh, technology that I use that speak, of yeah. course. See, I, have a, I have a talking um, tape measure. Okay. Okay. So some some things that I you know don't have to sit there and figure out how long or short something is, I can just pull it out and it'll speak for me. Yeah, and I actually forgot about the talking thermostat. I need to get one and the tape measure. But tell me about the talking microwave. I just label mine, but I'll be okay. very interested to um, hear how the uh, microwave worked and and where you you know got it from. Believe it or not, I got this microwave oven, I want to say, about maybe eight to 10 years ago. It was only $59, and it was selling it at Best Buy. Hmm. And they don't sell this microwave oven anymore. It is done. You can't, it's it's done. They just closed out on it, didn't make any more, and I don't know why. Mm -hmm. But on the microwave, there's some preset times. Like if I just want to 
uh, cook something for one minute or two minutes. So from one to five minutes, there are these buttons that speak and they'll say five minutes and you just press the button and it starts cooking. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a dial on there that if I want to fix other things, as I turn the dial, it'll speak and it'll say like soup, popcorn, uh, vegetables. And after you get to that particular item, uh, you'll press the button again and it'll ask you, uh, it'll have a weight there. Like for the soup, it might say, uh, four ounces, and the next one may say 10 ounces. And then you press the button, mm -hmm. and it'll just automatically set the time itself for how long that particular item should cook. Okay. So so it's uh, it's pretty good. It has a defrost button. If I want to defrost something by time or defrost something by weight, uh, it's on there. Okay, okay. And I... I guess if something happens to this, I will be going uh, <laughs> back to like how you're doing it now, where you have to get a microwave and then put your Braille overlay on it to um, figure out what is what. <laughs> well, just darn, because I just thought I was going to be able to buy this talking <laughs> microwave, but you know, I so know. did you? Maybe tell we can. Maybe what? we can make them come back. Right, I right. I was going to say, did you tell any of your friends about the talking microwave, and did they get any or? Yes, I do. I do have one of my uh, chapter members. She was able to get one because her son was looking for a microwave uh -huh. for her. Uh, that you know, back then, eight like I say, eight to ten years ago. <laughs> right. So and uh, he he was able to get one. Yes, it is. Okay. Yes, well. yes it is. Ten year old microwave still cooking. <laughs> I, I know that's right. Well, it's definitely. Um, nice to know that you're into technology and technology is is in pretty much every use of um, your day to day activities. Um, talk to me about the in the changes in the blindness community, you invoking change and um, some of the advocacy stuff that you guys are working on in, in Philadelphia. Well, I guess not just in Philadelphia, but through the state or through uh, the federal government, you know, we, we're, you know, always up on whatever we're talking about in the, the NFP when we have our Washington seminar, mm -hmm. uh, such as, you know, fair wages for workers with disabilities. So, of course, we, in some parts of our state, we were part of the protests against goodwill for uh, not paying, you know, fair wages to persons with disabilities, paying them less than the minimum wage. Mm -hmm. um, anything that we, you know, the, the different bills that have been out, you know, concerning Social Security or uh, bills about college students having their books in an accessible and timely fashion. Um, we're always advocating for uh, workers with disabilities who may have been discriminated against in some fashion at their jobs. So we may have uh, accompanied some disabled individuals to different hearings uh, at court. Mm -hmm. So, you know, basically, wherever someone is not trying to treat a uh, person with a disability um, with the rights that they were, you know, let's say, given at birth. Anybody that's trying to discriminate or bring down, um, we we try to be there uh, to let you know that, you know, there this is not right. Right. And uh, we're we're here to let you know it, and you know, you have to change. You have to make some changes, or, you know. Maybe, you know, if you can't, you think you can't make these changes, then maybe that is why some of the lawsuits, you know, have come into effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can definitely understand that, especially a person being big on employment um, for the blind and, and deaf blind. And to see that individuals, even though they have mm -hmm. um, a semblance of a job, are being paid less than what, you know, the minimum wage is um, so it's like a conflicting law if this is the minimum yes. then why are you um, paying 
individuals less than this and and right. you know don't willingly want to change it. Right. And they're putting out their output is as much as the person next to them who may not have a disability but they're not making the same amount of money. That's not right. Yeah, absolutely. So lots of uh fights to um fight against on that front. Um we've reached my favorite part of the show. The thunder moment, and this is where I asked you some questions, and um, you come back with brief and to the point responses. Sound like a plan? That that works for me. All right. So, who was your mentor growing up? Probably. I mean, I've had many mentors in my life, but probably the most influential person was my grandmother, my mother's mother, uh, Miss Mabel Lundy who basically uh, taught me a couple of things to be on time (laughs) and to be a woman of your word. If you say you're going to do something, then you should do it. Okay. Okay. And I was going to ask, what was the the best advice that your mentor gave you? Probably, Probably just being honest about things. One thing I can say about my grandmother, she was very honest Mm -hmm. no matter, you know, sometimes that honesty could hurt Mm -hmm. because, you know, depending on what the situation was. But I, as they say, honesty is the best policy. It really is. Okay. Yeah. So life has its ups and downs and I call it the roller coaster of life. But tell us uh, an up or a down that you had um, as a result of your blindness, and how did you overcome it or or celebrate in it? Well, one of the things I wanted to mention was it, this can be an up moment, a down moment, and an <laughs> aha moment in the same breath. Okay. But before I started using a white cane, you know, I was one of those people who would just try to use that little bit, bit of vision I had to get around different places. And one day I was in Center City, Philadelphia, walking around like normal and uh, turned a corner and, you know, kept walking down the street like I normally do. But then I, all of a sudden I was walking and I went up in the air and I came, and I started walking and I came down. Mm-hmm. And what I realized once I turned around was that I had walked on top of a homeless person. Wow. And that aha moment was, Denise, if you were using a white cane, you would have noticed that there was something there or somebody there, (laughs) and you would have walked around that obstacle. Mm. So even though I didn't right then and there, that next day or next month, basically start using a white cane, it really implanted a seed in my head that, I got to get my stuff together and do what I should do. <laughs> so that was truly a, a roller coaster. Roller coaster, <laughs> up, down, and aha. Uh-huh. I actually was using my cane and was walking to the corner store uh, and ran into a homeless person in the same fashion and, and was able mm-hmm. to recognize that there was something. I didn't realize that it was a homeless person until that individual started following me. And that was pretty creepy, but okay. (laughs) You know, I was able to use my cane so I didn't have to go through. Well, well, my person didn't even know what had happened. I I could see him put his head up Mm -hmm. and look around, but he didn't know what had happened. No, you didn't have on heels or anything, did you? No, no. Okay, because you would have just spiked his chest in, (laughs) you know, but, um, so of the innovations in technology um, today, what's exciting you the most? Wow. Um, in Philadelphia here, I was working with uh, Comcast Cable. Mm. And they have an innovation, which I believe they're going to try to launch in early 2014. Mm. And this will enable, um, it's sort of like voiceover with the television Mm -hmm. where you'll be able to, the the remote control that they have will be speaking so that you can basically go through the menus on the cable television and know, you know, what is what. Okay. Because one thing that is very hard to do if you cannot see is to 
Uh, say if you want to watch something on demand, where you have to go into the uh, cable listing itself and go through the different names of the shows. Right. Now, none of that, none of that is speaking. Mm -hmm. So either you have to have some kind of insight into uh, how many times you should press the button <laughs> one way or this way or right. that way in order to get to it. But the, the concept that they are working on right now will enable, will definitely enable a blind individual to do it by themselves. Okay, okay. And I must say, as long as Newsline has been out and as long as it's been available as an app on the App Store, mm -hmm. um, because I don't watch TV, but I was trying to find a solution for someone else. And... Um, talking to you with the whole Comcast and the audio described um, mm -hmm. channels, I did download and get my username and password and okay, and uh, started using it. And it was dead on. You know, I think when we had talked to you, I told me you have to pick the carrier in your specific market. Yes. Um, and then the channel guide would work. So um, yeah. you definitely helped with that. Um, speaking of helping, what's something that you would tell a person that is just become blind that they could do within the next week to help them start on their journey of um, being able to live with blindness. Wow, that's uh, that's a, a, a hard one for you know twenty four <laughs> hours. Right. But if that per if I, if someone calls me, and you know I guess I'm I'm a good advocate for blindness, of course. So mm -hmm. I always tell them, you know, my story and, you know, my situations. But then I also try to impart, um, like I have an article that I wrote um, for, the, for the Braille Monitor, which is the NFB's magazine a few years ago called uh, What a Relief. Mm -hmm. And it, talk, it basically talks about how I came to grips with uh, using a white cane. So, and then I might point them to a article that really meant a lot to me when I was going on this journey, which was uh, written by Everly Harrison uh, years before talking about her situation with uh, kind of coping with her blindness uh, once she started going to the Louisiana Center for the Blind. Mm -hmm. So both of those stories you know, really give some good information about, you know, things that we used to do or ways that we used to feel. But when we started either empowering ourselves by, you know, getting the training we needed or putting the white cane in our hand, um, then, you know, all that uneasiness kind of starts to go away. Because you really, you really bring yourself to a different mold, so to speak, when you, when you know that, uh, these tools that are out there are out there for you so that you can make yourself more independent and you would definitely feel more successful. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cause I mean, I literally, um, run into blind people all the time just from being out. And I know I gave advice for 24 hours, but you know, sometimes it's really, you know, five minutes or less that you have to impart some some mm -hmm. information into people's lives that, you know, may not change it today, but, you know, eventually they'll be able to tell that story of how they ran into a Denise or how they ran into a Vashon. And, you know, that person said that you can, you know, do anything that you want to do True. You know, with that proper training and that and the opportunities that you create. So, yeah, um, we have reached the end of the show. But um, we saved the last little bit, um, as they say, saving the best for last. Um, so tell us how we can reach you. Give us one parting piece of advice, and then we'll say goodbye. Well, you can reach me. My email address is D Brown. So that's D B R O W N eight eight two seven at aol dot com, and I guess my parting piece of advice is just um, learn that accessibility is your friend. 
and uh, learn, to, learn to use the tools that are out there and learn to uh, stay in contact with uh, a person who's blind or a person who's disabled uh, who you know can give you some mentoring advice. Okay, cool. Well, I'd like to thank Aaron Linkson, our podcast producer and sound engineer, uh, Denise Brown, our esteemed and lovely guest, and we'll say goodbye. All right, goodbye. <laughs>